right. Landon's getting me a table. I have quite a bit of stuff, and I don't want it falling everywhere. But um, my name's Pastor Evan, and I'm going to be ministering today. And how many of you know what series we're in this morning? Our vision series. That's right. So Pastor Nate is actually gone with several... Um, other fathers and sons in our church, and the Lord had laid it on his heart uh, at the beginning of this year, actually, to do a ministry trip, a father-son ministry trip. Um, so they're over in Oklahoma hunting, and he already said they've had God talks around the campfire and praying over the kids, praying over the fathers, so it's an awesome opportunity for him and for the student, some of the students in our church, so it's awesome. All right, so who's ready this morning? Okay, everyone look over and tell me what our vision is. That's right. And if you'll notice in the lobby over there, it says preaching Jesus, everyone in the house, everywhere in the world. Amen. So how many of you know you're a preacher? Say it. I'm a preacher. Yes, you are. Okay, let me get my stuff situated here. So our vision series is going to go a little longer than we thought, but that's a good thing. So um, I had known I was going to minister, and Pastor Nate had wanted to do, he taught everyone in the house last week, and how many of you were here for that? I want to encourage you to listen to that again, even if you were here, and if you weren't here, for sure listen to it. And I wanted to just go over a little bit of review um, from last week before we get into this week. Um, because it so ties in, and I had actually asked him if I could teach, like, part two of everyone in the house, because um, I just love the local church, and um, I'll share this here in a little bit, but I, you know, we don't, and we've told our boys this since they were little, little, since we started pastoring, that we would be as involved, we would be as committed to the local church that God has called us to, whether we were pastors or not. And this is something that I grew up in, and I'm so thankful my parents instilled into me and Nate's family instilled into him is just the importance of the local church and being connected where God has you. It's life or death. It really is life or death. And this is a message I was actually just um, talking to my friend Sarah Pearsons. I don't know how many of you know them, but they pastor out in... Colorado, it's Jeremy and Sarah Pearson's, and it's Brother Copeland's grandson, actually, but they're good friends of ours, and um, she was talking about they're getting a puppy, and so we were talking, and then she said, um, I told her I was ministering today, and she said, what are you talking on, and I said, the local church, she said, "Ooh, that's one of my favorite subjects, I said, well, send me all the good verses that you have, that you love, and she sent me, and um, she just said, it's a topic that I don't think gets taught enough, and I would have to agree that there's a lot of misconceptions that we have of church and what church is and what church is to be. So we're kind of going to talk about that this morning. But how many of you know faith comes when you hear the word? And so the more we hear the word on a topic, the more faith comes where we can receive it and believe it and then act upon it, right? Okay, so we're going to go over a little bit of review. And Pastor Nate last week, um, he just talked about walls. And he talked about really the foundation, which is the love of God, right? And so I'm just going to read a few things that he said here. He said, it starts in the house. As long as I have walls, it will hinder my light being seen by others. Walls are a big deal. I'm not just here to listen. I'm here to develop and put that into practice. And he talked about that it's important that there's a whole. How many of you know it's important for a whole body, to be together, not just fragments of a body, but for a whole body to be together. And he, um, he said this, and this is actually in our um, vision statement there. It says, God doesn't require perfection, but he does require growth. And how many of you know, sometimes we disqualify ourselves because we mess up or because someone else messes up, we disqualify them. But how many of you know, God doesn't require us to be perfect, but he does require us to grow. How many of you know we never stop growing? You could have been born again and in the church for 30, 40, 50 years, and you still have not arrived. 
And another thing is we're going to be in heaven for all of eternity, never having arrived. Ever learning about the Lord, ever growing in our relationship with him. Isn't that amazing? We'll never reach where we are like, oh, okay, we'll just stop. You're never done. You're always growing and learning. Um, And he said this, if Jesus isn't in these walls, then he won't be beyond these four walls. So how many of you know it's important that we grow inside the local church? We learn how to love one another. We learn how to love God. We learn how to put the word into practice. Because if we don't do it here, we're not going to do it out there. Oops, my thing's on here. Okay, a couple more. Um, He said this, am I harboring bitterness, unforgiveness, offense? It's a good question to ask. You know, seven days has passed, and I'm sure there's been plenty of opportunity to yet again do what? Harbor, bitterness, offense, frustration. But how many of you know we're a body who loves? We're quick to forgive. We're quick to believe the best. Um, I said this um, This was just something God spoke to me. If God's kindness led me to repentance, could God's kindness through me lead others to repentance? So if God's kindness led me to repentance, could God, or sorry, if God's kindness led me to repentance, could God's kindness through me lead others to repentance? So how many of you know God's not holding anything against us? So we shouldn't hold anything against others. And then last, um, I wrote this in all caps and underlined it real big. I always have a choice. I want everyone to say that this morning. I always have a choice. You know why? Because the enemy wants to convince you so many times that you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice in what they did to you. You don't have a choice in how you feel. You don't have a choice. You always have a choice. You always have an opportunity to make a choice and to go God's way every time. You're free to choose. Isn't that amazing? God didn't make robots. He gave us free. He gave mankind free will to choose him and to choose his way. Okay. So we're going to do kind of um, part two of this vision series, everyone in the house and I'm just going to kind of piggyback off that. But I wanted um, to just highlight that because how many of you know the love of God is so foundational? Because how many of you know that our faith works on what? Love. So if love's not in play, then our faith's not working. So for some of us, we're wondering why maybe prayers aren't being answered or certain things we're believing for haven't come about. But then let's look back and say, where's my love been? Where's my love been for the Lord? Where's my love been for other people? And oftentimes when we get those things adjusted, it's quick. Things get answered quick. Light comes quickly because our faith has to be based on the love of God. And so that's why last week I love what he talked about because nothing works. Nothing for this vision, nothing for the call of God on your life is going to work apart from the love of God. And knowing how much he loves you and then how much you can love others because of that. Okay? So um, let's just pray before uh, we get into the rest this morning. Father, we worship you. We thank you so much for all that you're doing in this body. And we say this morning that we are hungry for your word. And, Lord, we understand that as we come, we're not coming to hear from a man, but we're coming to hear from you. So that's where our expectation is, that we hear clearly. And we thank you that our eyes are open, our ears are open to everything that you have for us this morning. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I want you to turn your head and look to the left. It's really big. You might have to look up. Your expectation is an invitation for God to move. So how many of you know, I came prepared and expecting this morning, but that's not enough. I'm going to say that again. I came prepared and expecting this morning, but that's not enough. You have a part to play. Your expectation is an invitation for God to move. So what does that mean? 
I should bring my Bible to church. I should bring my notebook to church. No condemnation if you didn't. Don't look at the person to the right or to the left of you. (laughs) But here's why. God is speaking to me. And we have to treat every time we come to church, it is not a man speaking to us. God uses people. But it's God speaking to me. And I can bet your bottom dollar that if we announce through a text that Jesus was coming today in person to be on church from the pulpit, y'all would probably have looked a little different and y'all probably would have brought your Bibles and your notebooks. And you'd be up and ready. Why? Because Jesus is here today. Well, guess what I'm here to announce to you? Jesus is in the midst of us today, speaking to you today. So we got to act like it, church. Why? Because when I come to church and I'm taking notes, it's, it's not about religious duty. And it's not about checking a box of, I'm a good Christian because I come and I bring my Bible and a notebook. It's about understanding when I'm coming, I'm coming to be equipped. And if I'm coming to be equipped, I need to have something so that I can take down what I need to know to be equipped so that I can not just leave it in a notebook, but I can Go over it again, and I can put it into practice. And we're just not good enough humans to remember. How many of you know you can leave your house five minutes later and remember everything in your head that you need at Walmart, and you show up to Walmart, and you're like, oh, shoot, what do I need? (laughs) Right? And then you're texting someone and asking, why? Because we don't remember everything. That's why God told us, write it down, make it plain, so that you can run with it. What does that mean? Put it into practice, right? Again, no condemnation if you didn't, but I encourage you to do it. There has been so much in my life where I look back, and I am so thankful I wrote stuff down. Because it's God speaking to me. And guess what? God, what God spoke to you never expires, you know that? So like prophetic words or his words spoken to you, what does it say? It's alive. It's full of power. It never expires. It never loses its power. We can diminish it on our side because of time. And we can say, oh, well, that was 10 years ago and I'm still not. No, it's still as alive today as it was 10 years ago. The words that he spoke to you, the words that he's given you over your marriage, over your family, Hold on to it. It's still as alive today as it was the day that he spoke it. Okay? Are we stirred up? Are we expectant? Amen. Okay. So I'm just going to read this. I don't know if you still have that. I forgot to tell you to have it up, but I'll just read it. Everyone in the house, and this was a a write-up that we did for this. It says, Matthew 5, 14 through 15. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Say, everyone in the house. So we know the message of Jesus cannot be carried outside the house without it first being inside. We take seriously Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, which tells us it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to equip the saints for works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. And here we have it bold, to equip the saints for works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. God doesn't require perfection, but he does require growth. We assemble to be strengthened and equipped through the teaching and exercising of the word to not only preach the message, but live it. You were created for good works. Say it. I was created created. for good works. God designed everyone to preach the message of Jesus to the world. Beyond Church is a body of believers continually equipped for works of service who build up the body of of Christ by preaching Jesus beyond the four walls. Okay, so um, I want to um, just go to a few verses here. Psalms, um, and I'm just going to, I didn't put translation, but I'm just going to read it out of my Bible, which is the BSV. I know we don't have that, but whatever translation they got up there, you can follow along or just read in your own. 
Psalms 92, 12 through 14. And all these verses are talking about the importance of the local church and being planted and the result of what happens when you stay planted in God's house. How many of you know there is fruit that happens when you stay planted? It's true. Psalms 92, 12 through um, uh, 14, 15. It says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they will still bear fruit. Healthy and green, they will remain to proclaim the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and in him there is no unrighteousness. Woo, what a powerful verse. But what is the preface for all of that good stuff? Rooted and planted in the house. So some of us may be wondering why our lives look certain ways. Let's ask ourselves one area. Have I been planted in God's house? Because this is a promise I can hold on to for me, for my children, for my grandchildren. I will stay planted in God's house. And when I do, I will flourish. How many of you know that hasn't expired? His promise never expires. And guess what? You may look, I may have said that, and you may have said, well, my life doesn't look like that. That's okay. His promise is still true. His promise is still true, and you can hold on to that promise. Why? Because he is faithful to perform it for you. Amen? Isaiah 61.3. And it says this, to console the mourners in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So who gets glorified when I stay planted? When you're faithful to stay where God's called you. God gets glorified. Why? Because the body gets built up, and we're going to talk about that. But you know what? I just felt as I was reading this, there's oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. Some of you, I just felt like this has nothing to do necessarily with this, what I'm teaching, but I just felt like this was a verse for you. Oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. You know, depression and despair, it says here, is a spirit. But you know what's amazing? Is you've been seated next to him in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, which is where depression is from. The pit, darkness. And there is oil of joy for mourning (laughs) and a garment of praise. Okay, so I want to talk about this for a second. And I didn't intend to go here. But the Holy Spirit did. Garment of praise. What does that mean? That means I have to put something on. That means it doesn't just happen because I want it to happen. How many of you know there is an act of faith? There is a sacrifice of praise. There is something physically that you have to do. It doesn't just fall on you. What does it say? A garment of praise, which means I actually have to put on a garment of praise, which means when it's time to put on the garment of praise, I don't want to put on that garment. My flesh doesn't. My flesh doesn't want to put on the garment of praise. And I've done this before in my house when there has been a spirit of oppression or depression that tries to come. First of all, it's a spirit, so you resist it. And that's what I've learned to do. When those anxious thoughts or stuff wants to come, it doesn't matter where I am. Driving in my car, in my house, I'm at work, it doesn't matter where I am. I resist that in the name of Jesus. God has not given me a spirit of fear. You know, you can resist that. You don't have to accept it. So you resist it. 
But then you know what you begin to do? You begin to magnify him. You begin to put on a garment of praise. What does that mean? I've never seen people praise with... Well, actually, I have. <laughs> Leading worship, we have seen that. <laughs> but we don't let it move us. But you know what? <laughs> then that's not real faith praise. Because real faith praise, you have a smile on your face. And if you don't want to smile, you make yourself smile. You smile. You put on a garment of praise. You start, I've done this before, and your flesh is like, what, Evan, what are you doing? I'm putting on a garment of praise. So I put it on, and I begin to act it out. I begin to thank the Lord. I begin to lift my hands. I've ran around my house. I've twirled. I've done all sorts of stuff that you would probably look at and be like, she is absolutely crazy. But you know what? I am putting the word into work. I'm going to put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness and an oil of joy for mourning. So why, why do I feel like God's highlighting this? Because, church, we have to be full of joy. We cannot be a depressed people. We have to look different than the world. I don't go to some, If I'm dealing with that, I'm not going, well, hopefully I'm not, going to someone else who is walking around like this. I'm going to go find someone who is joyful, who has hope. Church, that's what we are. We carry the hope of the world. Jesus, we have an answer. Anyways, time for the church to be full of joy. And laughter and happiness. Okay, we'll keep going. Okay. Jeremiah 7, I am only, okay, we'll just keep going. Jeremiah 17, <laughs> we're going to get where we get. Okay, Jeremiah 17, we'll read um, 5 through 8. It says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind who makes the flesh his strength and turns his heart from the Lord. So how many of you know when you make yourself your strength, it moves you away from him? He will be like a shrub in the desert. That doesn't sound very good. He will not see when prosperity comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. What is that? Loneliness, abandonment, dry, arid, no life. But verse 7 tells us this. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He is like a tree planted Notice what that says, planted by the waters that sends out its roots. Guess what that means? It's not going anywhere. If something's planted and now it's beginning to send out its roots, that means that's where it's staying. Toward the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes and its leaves are always green. It does not worry in a year of drought, nor does it cease to produce fruit. So what do we see here? This can be a promise for us. When we stay planted, and I'm not saying that you're necessarily called to a church the entire time you're here on planet Earth. God does call. We've seen that here in our church family. God does call, but then he calls you and plants you somewhere else. And church hopping around is not God's best for you. And you can just see that in life. If you take a tree and plant it, and then the next year pull it up and then plant it somewhere else, and then pull it up and then plant it somewhere else, and then you're frustrated at the tree for not bearing fruit. Am I planted? And planted doesn't mean every now and then. Planted means all the time. And what does it promise me there? That guess what? When the economy's messing up, when stuff's going on, when wars are around, when whatever, I don't have to fear. Why? Because I know what God's called me to do with who he's called me to do it. I'm on mission. I'm planted in God's house. And because of that, I will flourish. Okay, Psalm 68, 6. It says this, God settles the lonely in families. 
He leads the prisoners out to prosperity. Do you know God's very intent from the very beginning was family? God designed us to be a part of a family. Not just your physical family, but a church family. Did you know we are in, if you're born again, you're in the body of Christ, which is what? The family. But then that's a huge body. So God has called us to be into local churches, into a family. And each family has a different mission. Each church, that's why it's silly to compare churches. Because we're all called for different assignments and for different things, but ultimately to do what? To bring glory to God, to bring more into the kingdom. So just like it would be silly to compare your marriage and your family to another person, it's silly for us to do that with churches. What should we be about? Blessing them and saying, thank you, Lord, they're doing what God's called them to do. And thank you, Lord, we're doing what we're called to do. And ultimately, we're building up the body. Okay. Um, Acts 2, um, we'll go here. And these are all just, just giving scriptures, giving the words, so we can see the importance of staying planted and what it does for us. So this is after Jesus um, has ascended. They were waiting in the upper room. And this is Acts um, 2, 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And I just highlighted that. They were all together in one place. How many of you know there's something about being together in one place? And then further over in chapter 2, verse 44, it says, All the believers were together. There we see it again, the word together. And then verse 46, With one accord, they continued to meet. How many of you know it's important that we continue to meet? It's important that we're together. And we're going to look at that here. Okay, so I just wanted to preface a few things before um, we get into this even deeper. That when Pastor Nate and I talk about these things, it's not because we want a bigger church. The reason God calls a pastor to teach on these things is for your health. And for your growth and your development. Because when we neglect these things, when we don't know maybe what the word has said on it, or we do, but we've just, you know, it can be easy to just let some things go. How many of you know those are areas where the devil can get in and have access? Okay, and then also prefacing this. When talking about this today and the local church and the importance of the local body, we're talking about the corporate, okay? I am not, because I'm talking about the corporate today, I am not saying that your individual relationship with the Lord is not important. It takes both. Your personal relationship with the Lord, you opening the word for yourself, you feeding yourself continually has to happen and must happen, but not to the detriment of also coming together corporately. Does that make sense? Just like... I'm going to be a spiritual baby if all I depend on is the corporate setting when I come once a week, hopefully. I mean, some of us are doing good if we come once a month. And if that is my spiritual diet, I am a spiritual baby. I am not growing up. So how many of you know it takes the corporate, but it also takes the individual? It's both. What I'm talking about today is the corporate, not to negate the individual, okay? Okay, so the significance of your life can be summed up in a very few words. What you say yes to God about. What I say yes to God about. How many of you know where you're sitting, where you're at today, is a product of what you've said yes or no to, to God? So, like I said, we're going to talk about everyone in the house saying yes to his plan, and we cannot dismiss the power and vitalness of the local church. So that's what we're going to talk about today. God always uses people to get you where you need to go and to get you to grow up spiritually. 
I'm going to say that again. God always uses people to get you where you need to go and to get you to grow up spiritually. You're not isolative. You're not meant to do life alone. And just, I just love Jesus by myself. That's not scriptural. Okay, let's look at Ephesians 1.18. Have it there. It says, pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So what do we see here? It says his calling. So your calling is embedded into his calling. Your calling is embedded into his calling. So if you don't understand that it is his calling and not yours, then you will believe it came from you and that it's all about you. Your calling does not originate with you. It originates with him. When you get hooked up with his calling, he can reveal yours. So for us to fulfill our divine purpose in our time, we must understand the great plan that God has made us a part of. Okay? You don't, it's not your calling. We hear a lot about that. Well, what I'm called to. Well, what, what's my calling? Well, what am I called to? You're, no, 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 no. You are called to something, but it's first embedded in his calling. Yeah, that's right. From that place, we find out our calling. Yeah, right. So you are in the church. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are the church. Say it. I am the church. I am in the church. So you're a part of God's family and Christ's body, and you're a member of the body of Christ. Many times we've not been taught the value of the local church and why it matters. You may not realize it, but not being connected in and participating in the place God has set you causes you to live for yourself and not for the plan of God. Matthew 16, 18, let's look there. It says this, Jesus is talking to Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it or prevail against it. So Jesus died for the church. And what is Jesus about right now? Building his church. So if Jesus is about building his church, and we just read in Ephesians 1, his calling, what's my calling? Everyone in here has been called to works of service. Pastor Nate just talked about that last week. A minister. A minister to do what? To reconcile others to him. So my call is to do what? To build up the body of Christ. By doing what? Reaching for those who are lost and unsaved, which we're going to talk about in the weeks to come. But also inside the local church, his calling is for me to build up the body. So what does that mean? When I take notes, put them into practice, begin to grow, guess what it's doing? It doesn't just affect me. This is why it's so important. You growing up isn't just about you. You growing up is about affecting other people. It's about growing up. How many of you know a baby only thinks about themselves? Yes? They don't care that they're crying at 2 in the morning because they're hungry. Why? Because they're hungry and they want food now. Well, let's take this over spiritually. I can tell where I'm at spiritually. There's many ways to tell. But one way that I can tell that I'm still a baby is when I'm just thinking about myself. And I'm walking in these doors and out these doors, never serving anyone but myself. I'm not growing up. Many people also, online church is great. Reaching people online is great. But you will not grow to the mature believer God's had you if you just watch online. Why? Because coming into God's house with God's people 
forces me to grow if I allow it. Why? Because I, I put into practice, I give, I serve, I grow, I put into practice. Someone gives me a dirty look and I have to overlook it and forgive. I grow. That's right. That's right. But you know when I don't grow? When I didn't like the music, so I'm leaving. This person didn't talk to me, so I'm gone. You never pass that test and you never grow past that. Stay planted. That's where you grow. Okay. I'm going to read some from this book. Story time with Pastor Evan. Just kidding. Okay. So I'm just going to read for a moment about the church um, and what the word says about the church. Okay. Um, Let me make sure this is. Okay. Someone once said that the church is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. It's where you grow deeply anchored in God's word and everyone does their part because all their lives depend on it. That kind of commitment makes it an honor to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. The way you view God's people reviews, reveals the way you view God. God loves his people and he wants you to love them too. He created you to be a part of a family and a member of a body. Those are both very intimate relationships, and those relationships happen to be the key to your understanding who you are and where you fit into God's strategic plan for, you, for today, the church. The significance and power of your place in God's family, Christ's body, and the local church is revealed even more when you understand the meaning of the word that was translated church. Why did Jesus and the Holy Spirit choose this particular word? Jesus was the first to use the word church in Matthew 16, 18. We just read that. When he said he would build his church, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, and this word is used 114 times in the New Testament. Ninety of those references refer to a local assembly of believers. So oftentimes when we talk about the church, we talk about the church like the whole broad body of Christ. So the majority of time in the New Testament when ecclesia or church is mentioned, 90 times out of the 114 is talking about a local assembly. So it must be pretty important. Okay. um, The reason I tell you this is that sometimes believers don't want to emphasize the local church. They just want to talk about the universal church. They believe you don't really need to have a pastor in your life or a place where you come together with the same group of saints on a regular basis. They can just go to a coffee shop and talk about Jesus with a couple of friends and have church. Getting together with a couple of Christian friends is not having church. It is good, but it is not the same. Believers are beginning to have all kinds of unscriptural ideas about the local church and the universal church, and because of this thinking, they are diminishing the work of God and losing sight of the plan of God. Who did Jesus say would bind and loose? My church. Who did Jesus say would prevail against the gates of hell? My church. So let's find out exactly what his church is. The word ecclesia literally means a called out assembly. Some assembly is required. The church is not just a group of people who have decided to meet on a regular basis. The church is a group of people who have heard the call of God and have come together under the unction and anointing of the Holy Ghost. God is the one who calls you out to assemble with other saints in the local church. Then as you are assembled and relating to one another, he reveals your individual purposes in the context of your corporate purpose. And then I'm going to read um, William Barclay's definition of Ecclesia. He says, um, the Septuagint, sorry, I don't know how you say that, translates the Hebrew word kahal, which again comes from a root word meaning to summon. It is regularly used for the assembly or the congregation of the people of Israel. In the Hebrew sense, it therefore means God's people called together by God in order to listen to or act for God. I'm going to keep reading here in a minute, but I want to highlight this. And I want everyone listening really closely. Because when you realize that coming to church isn't just... I feel like it today. 
ah, I don't feel like it today. Ah, maybe I'll go. Ah, maybe I won't. But when we realize what this really means, it's God summoning me. Try having someone summon you for jury duty and decline and see what happens. Sometimes we treat work, showing up to work, more of a priority than we do God's house and God's people. But what is first? His calling and my place in his calling. When these priorities, and you know what? Some of you, this may be tough to swallow, but this is called equipping. This is what we're called to do. You know why? Because for some of us, there's hindrances in our lives, and this is why. Because we're not taking seriously the coming together and gathering together as God's summoning, God summoning me to come. And if God's summoning me to something, it must be pretty important for my flourishing and my growth. Okay, so it means a body of people who have been summoned out of their homes to come and meet with God. A summons from God to every man to come and to listen to and act on the word of God. So it's just what we said. God uses people, but what is it? I'm coming to hear God. In essence, therefore, the church, the ecclesia, is a body of people, not so much assembling because they have chosen to come together, but assembling because God has called them to himself. Not so much assembling to share their own thoughts and opinions, but assembling to listen to the voice of God. Okay, let me make sure that was. um. So the focus of these definitions of the church is that God calls his people to come together to hear from him and act on his word. Since we have established that an ecclesia is a particular group called together by God at a particular place, we can deduce what Jesus meant when he used that word. Not only did Jesus declare his goal of building his church, but by choosing ecclesia, he declared the strategy he would use to build it, the local assembly. This is how he's building his body, local churches. Okay? It's the local church that reveals the universal church. Without local churches, there is no understanding of the universal church. I wrote earlier that 90 of the 114 times the word ecclesia is used, it refers to a local assembly. While you are living and breathing on planet earth, you need to be a part of a local church. As part of a local church, you will hear the plan of God and be supernaturally empowered to play your part in his plan. Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, my convened assembly of people, my elected officials elected by me. Those I have endowed with power from the Holy Ghost and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You must understand that when you become a Christian, the church isn't made for you. You are made for the church. The church is your place in the plan of God. Okay. Now, I have these um, puzzle pieces. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Do we have that? 1 Corinthians 12, 27. I can turn there. So this is all about the parts of the body. And it says this, now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a member of it. So say that. I'm a member of the body of Christ. So guess what you are? You're a piece. You're a part of the body of Christ. So if I handed everyone a puzzle piece this morning, You just walking around with your individual puzzle piece, you'd kind of wonder, like, how do I fit? How does this, what's the purpose of this? So just say you're just living life as a a born-again Christian, but you're not connected to the local church. You're holding your puzzle piece, and you're wondering, where do I fit? Where do I belong? What, it's just, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what God's called me to do. But the moment that that puzzle piece uh, answers to the summoning that God's given, 
that we just read about of where he summoned you to be? So you know what? He can summon you to be at a certain spot, but you chose to go somewhere else. But your spot's there. You're still going to wonder. But the moment that I have my peace and I know where God summoned me to be and I bring that peace, guess what? I fit there. So it's almost like each local church is a puzzle. And God calls people to that puzzle to bring their supply and that peace to do what? To bring glory to him, which is what? The puzzle done. So when I bring my peace to the body that he's connected me to, I fit. And I don't have to wonder. But even if I come to where God summoned me and where I'm supposed to be, and I still just sit and I never bring my peace, I'm still going to wonder why I don't fit. You have to put some action. Get in, serve. Be a part of a small group. Get in and get connected and begin to serve other people. And in that place, in his calling, like we talked about, he's building his church. When I begin to do that and throw myself into what he's doing, I find my individual purpose. Okay. Sorry, there's several story times because <laughs> this was so good. Okay. Being a member of the universal church is a spiritual reality, but understanding that spiritual reality is dependent upon a natural function. How do you express the spiritual reality of being in Christ? How do you, as a member of his universal body, become a functioning member physically and tangibly expressing the gifts and calling God has given you in your local body? Your local church is where you function in the reality of being in the universal church. The local body is where you play your part and fulfill your call as a member of Christ's body. You're not floating around. How many of you know, even in your own body, we don't just have floating body pieces around. That would be really weird. Right? So it's just like your local body. We shouldn't just have floating pieces around. Everyone has a function. Everyone has a fit. Just like your body pieces do. To do what? To have your body working and functioning. So you are automatically in the universal church the moment you are born again. But you have to choose to be committed to a local church. That's not just automatic. When you receive Jesus, what was automatic is you were now brought into the body of Christ. Now I have to make a choice to say, now because I'm in the universal body of Christ, I have to take my place in my local church and be committed there. God has called you out of the world to be a part of his body. That is a spiritual reality. But the spiritual reality manifests into the natural realm through the local church where you will be discipled and where you grow up. The local church is the key to your life in Jesus Christ. Okay, Matthew 9, 35 through 36, and this is in the Amplified. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the kingdom, um, and curing all kinds of disease and every weakness and infirmity. When he saw the throngs, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered, harassed, and distressed, and dejected, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So the New King James Version says, fainted and scattered. So Jesus saw, he went about, and what did he do? He taught in their synagogues, which would be he taught in church, which means he valued church. He went to church. And he proclaimed the good news. Did he go about doing that? Yes. But not at the expense of not being in church as well. That's right. So sometimes we look at Jesus' ministry as just, oh, it was just all out. No, he was also planted in God's house. Yes. And you see that multiple times through his ministry. Okay, but when he saw the throngs of people, he was moved because he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Must be pretty vital to have a sheepfold. And to have a shepherd. It's important to have a pastor, and it's also important to be part of a sheepfold. Why? In the fold, you're protected. When you're off by yourself, you're vulnerable. Okay, so what do we see? That they were fainted. Fainted could mean tired, not finishing. So guess what? When 
when we're not a part of the local church, when we're not coming and being strengthened, we get tired. Have you ever noticed that before? I have myself. I'm like, I'm ready to come to church. I need a word. Why? It helps me in my race. It helps me where I don't quit. Other believers strengthen me and help me where I don't quit. So it's the preaching of the word, but it's also the assembly of the body being the body to you, helping you when you need it. And then it says that they were scattered. So what does that mean? They're vulnerable to pray. They're easily taken out. If, if we're scattered, it makes it a lot easier for the enemy to do what? To come and. So it's a lot more easy to be taken out. So we see that the local church helps us finish our race and not quit. And it helps us not be scattered and easily taken out. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm going to see for time just where I want to go here. Let's look at, um, well, I just want to say this, um, and I've shared this before. I shared it at the beginning, but also other times, that I grew up in a local church um, really all my life, and my parents taught me the importance of that. And now going back and listening to Pastor Mac and Lynn, I told Mona this the other day. I was like, I realized he hits it like every week from the pulpit the importance of staying connected in your local church, serving in your local church. So we were like local church people, and it wasn't an option. Like, I couldn't go to my mom and be like, ah, mom, do we have to go today? Are we going? It was, it was never a thought in my mind like that I wouldn't wake up on Sunday and go to church. It was a habit. It was just part of what we did. And so I just want to encourage you, men and women and part of the households, your homes, this is a way to lead your family. Go to the house of God. Go to the house of God. And you know what? There's going to be days you wake up and don't feel like it. How many times do we wake up and not want to go to work? But we put more trust in man and in mammon and in sustaining than we do in God's house, which is the sustaining We just read that. We don't put our trust in man's strength. Where do we put it? In God. And when you put God first, it opens the door for blessing in your life. So, how many of you know church attendance should be a habit? A faithful habit. There is some habits that we need to have. And so, because of that habit, then when Nate and I got married... And um, we moved to Tulsa where we went to Bible school. Guess what? We didn't consider Bible school local church. That was extra feeding. So guess what we did? We got plugged in and we served at Rama, where God's called us to be for that season. And we knew we weren't going to be there forever. But we knew while we're here, we're going to be planted in God's house. It's not an option. And guess what? By that time, mom and dad weren't making us. This was instilled into us. This is what we do. It's valuable. And then when we came here, we weren't pastoring right away. We just came to help and get plugged in. And we knew we have to be a part of a local church. This is God's design. So I'm not saying that to pat ourselves on the back. I'm saying that to say it's vital to your growth and development and developing into who God's called you to be. Okay? So... Many times we're, we are saying to God, speak to me, speak to me. And many times he is speaking what you need to hear, but you just aren't he- there to hear it. And again, like I said at the beginning, this isn't negating your personal time with the Lord. But there are some things that God will only speak to you in the local assembly where he's called you. And if you are missing, you're missing it. You're missing what he's saying. Jesus is all we need for our redemption. No man needs to do anything else to make you a child of God. Jesus did that work for us. But once you come into his family, it is required for you to grow up. And just like we read earlier in Ephesians 4, he gave gifts unto men, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And that's to do what? To equip us. So the real equipping of the saints happens in the local assembly. But you have to be there in order for your gifts to be developed. My gifts don't develop if I aren't developed if I'm not here. OK. 
okay? Um, Luke 4, 16, we'll just write that. We won't go there, but it talks about how um, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, sounds like a habit, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So guess what? Jesus not only had a habit of teaching in the synagogue, but he also had a habit of going to the synagogue, going to church. So if Jesus, the Son of God, needed church, that was God's plan. Guess what? God summoned Jesus, and God has summoned us. And then when they asked him, you know, remember where he got lost? And they were trying to find him, and that's where he was. He was at the synagogue. And when his parents said, where were you? He said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? So where was his father's business? Church. What should be our business? Church. Why? So that I can be built up. So that I can be effective for God to get glory. Right? Okay, Hebrews 10.25. And out of the Amplified, it says, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. So what do we see here in this verse? Some people forsake assembling. And what does that mean? They give it up completely. They just get out of the habit of going and they just totally give it up. And then um, some people just neglect it. What does that mean? They do it when it's convenient. They do it when I have time or it's optional. But how many of you know both of these things he's addressing and saying, neither of those things are okay. All the more as we see the day approaching, we need to come together. So like we said, some people say Jesus is all I need. For your redemption, yes, Jesus is all you need. But once you are saved, you need someone to help teach you. You need the safety of a pastor and a local church. It needs to become a habit. How many of you know we can have bad physical habits? Everyone in here could raise their hand and say, I have bad physical habits, right? That we want to change and that we want to fix. And those negatively affect your life, right? Bad habits. But how many of you know you can also have bad spiritual habits, that affect you spiritually. And how many of you know what affects you spiritually affects you outwardly in your body? So not being connected and receiving a supply and giving a supply in the local church that God has called you to is a bad habit. And we talked about this, but this is a great question to ask ourselves. Is my attendance to my workplace more consistent than my attendance to the local church and people that God has connected me to? Because there is a spiritual service that I am to do. So when I miss church, I miss vital answers needed in my life when tests and trials come. If we diminish the place of our local church, we diminish and thwart the plan of God, not only for ourselves, but also for our neighborhood, our city, and possibly our region, nation, and the world. If we do not allow the Holy Spirit to connect us in a local body of believers, we will never be stirred, provoked, and inspired to grow up and develop our gifts and fulfill the plan that God has for our lives. So we won't go here, but you can write down 1 Corinthians 12, and really the whole chapter is a great chapter on just the part of, parts of the body functioning, where God's connected you, all of that. And so how many of you know, like we talked about earlier, you're not going to function at optimum level if you're not connected where God's called you to be. Um, Okay, and I wanted to hit this, so this was like a couple years ago, and my husband has lots of uh, stories of angels and protection, we'll just say that, but he was doing something, you know, just very Nate-like, and uh, he he was in a tractor bucket with Samuel running it, running the tractor, he was up in the bucket with the chainsaw, (laughs) I know, I know, um, I was not there, or it would not have happened. But anyways, um, something happened, and the, he cut a branch, and it fell and hit the, the tractor, which hit the lever, which caused the bucket to whatever. Anyway, he fell out of the bucket. And thankfully, he didn't totally damage himself. But he did, like, 
pop his ribs out of place. But at the time, he didn't really know that he did. And he was very thankful because, like, he land, how he landed and everything was totally the Lord's protection. Anyways, we were about to leave, like, one or two days later for Florida for family vacation. Of course, he loves to, like, go in the water with the boys and do all of that stuff. Well, he was, like, immensely hurting. And he's like, I don't know what is wrong, but, like, I can't move. He's like, I don't know if I broke my ribs. I don't know if my ribs are just out of place. Anyway, so it affected, like, our vacation. We got back, and he was like, I need to go to the chiropractor. So he scheduled an appointment, went to the chiropractor. Chiropractor looked at him, and he was like, I don't, you know, nothing's broken and stuff, but we do need, like, I can see where your rib, like, several of your ribs are out of place, and they have to be popped back. So how many of you know, when a rib's out of place, you're not functioning right? <laughs> and you're not functioning at full capacity, so um, that visit, he kind of worked with him and I think kind of partially popped one in. Anyways, it was like a two to three week process where he was going several times a week and the chiropractor told him it's not an immediate fix. It's going to be several times, but we'll work on it and eventually got them all popped back into place. But every time Nate went to the chiropractor, it was like, oh, it was more relief, more relief, more relief. So I said that whole story to say, this is why we have to keep coming to church and hearing the word. Things don't go back into place hearing just one time. It's continual feeding on his word, staying connected to where he's called me and occupying my place in the body that keeps me connected to the flow of life that is necessary for my health and growth. The time we live in calls for the role of the local church in our life. The role of the church has always been necessary, but even more now in the last days. And I'm just going to, can you guys just stay with me for just a few more minutes? Revelation 1, 10 through 13, and then 16 through 17 in the Amplifies um, says this. And this is, obviously we know John on the island of Patmos. And um, this is in regards to the time that we live in. And how many of you know we are in the end of the end? Yes. And you don't have to look very far to see that right? So just like what Hebrews 10 talked to us about, all the more as we see the day approaching, which tells us we can tell when the day is approaching. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it. And guess what he tells us? All the more as you see the day approaching, which means our church involvement and our plugging into his calling in my local church, I should be more committed today than I was five years ago. I should be more about what can I do to serve? What can I do to help? What can I do to preach Jesus, everyone, everywhere? Right, right. This is my calling. Right. This is our calling. Right. Amen. Okay, so it says, um, Revelation um, 1, 10 through 13. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice like the calling of a war trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Write promptly what you see, your vision in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thy... I don't know how you say that. And to Sardis and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose was the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a robe, which reached to his feet and with a girdle of gold about his breast. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and from his mouth there came forth a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full power at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and last. And then Revelation 1, 19 through 20. Write, therefore, the things that you see, what they are, and signify, and what is to take place hereafter. As to the hidden meaning, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand, and the seven lampstands of gold, the seven stars are the seven angels or messengers of the seven assemblies or churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we see in John's time, a lampstand was a tall oil-burning lamp. It was a type of the Holy Spirit and the light of God's word that give us divine illumination in this dark, fallen world. Jesus told John that the bearers of divine illumination were the local churches. He is reminding John of something he taught the disciples before his death. So let's look at uh, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. So we're talking about the importance of the local church. And what's interesting is in Revelation, Jesus is in the midst of the local churches. But he also talks about that them as lampstands, which means what? 
they're the light. The word, because why? Because you carry Jesus in you. We are the light, and that's what we're going to see here. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So your light will shine brightest when you commit to the local church. Jesus is in the local church today. He knows everything that is going on in our churches. That's what you see in the book of Revelation. He addresses each and every one. And how many of you know, he knows what's going on in local churches. And he has specific instructions for each individual body of believers. We talked about that. And if you're not there, you'll miss what he's saying. If you want to receive specific instructions concerning Jesus' strategy on the earth today, you have to be in your place in your church because that is where Jesus is speaking to his people. Okay, and then I just want you to write these verses down. We won't go to all of them, but I just want you to see in Revelation how many times Jesus said he's coming quickly. Revelation 3.11 says, I'm coming quickly. In the message it says, I'm on my way. I'll be there soon. Revelation 22.7 Revelation 22.12, Revelation 22.20. So we see he keeps telling us over and over, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. And as I was preparing for this, this is what I just heard. Church, he's coming quickly. He's coming quickly. And we have to be about his business. We have to put aside our own agenda, our own whatever, and be about his plan and saying, Lord, that fits into your plan, but I'm going to be all about your plan, all into what you're doing, building your church. So now more than ever, we must prioritize our relationship with the Lord and be all into what he's doing, building his church. The darker it gets, the brighter the light of Jesus will shine through us and this local church. And how many of you know when we um, reach people and when you know, people get born again and people, and I'm not saying everyone's called to be on church, but I am saying when you go out and preach Jesus, everyone everywhere, and people are getting born again and people are getting touched, the next step is, hey, where, find out where God's called you to be. Get plugged into a church. That should be our next step, church. And I can't encourage someone to get connected to the church if I'm not. Because we all know, like, there's nothing worse than telling someone to do something that you're not doing yourself. But how many of you know it's important, yes, for them to be born again, but to grow up, to grow up. And it's vital for them to grow up in Christ. And how many of you know discipleship is the work of the local church? It's where you are discipled and where you grow up. Okay, and then last thing, the assembling of believers in these last days is integral to his second coming. Just as John the Baptist was given a mandate from heaven to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus, the church has been given the mandate from heaven to prepare the way for his second coming. Going to church shouldn't be last on our list. It must be a top priority because that is how God is moving in our time, and the time is short. And so that's what I just keep hearing is he's coming quickly. He's coming quickly. He's coming quickly. And I want to be, and you know, Pastor Nate says this a lot, that will I find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? Church, will he find us about his father's business? Will he find us in our local church, growing and developing, reaching out to others? But how many of you know it first starts with everyone in the house? You notice that's first. Everyone in the house is before everywhere in the world. And just like Pastor Nate last week, love has to be the foundation, has to be the foundation how we operate, that this house, this people, is an atmosphere of faith and love, has to be present. But also we have to be more committed than we've ever been to our local this local church, if this is where God's called you, then plug in. If this isn't where he's called you, that's fine. Then go find where it is and get plugged in and use your gift to bring glory to him. Because God is using, this is how the message of Jesus is spreading, is through churches being planted, 
people growing up in the body. I just had a testimony. My mom and dad, I know a lot of you knew them because they pastored here and turned it over to us. They went overseas, and now they're back up in Minnesota where I grew up helping Pastor Mac and Lynn. And the big emphasis that they have is planting churches, missions and planting churches. And she just sent me a whole long text of just the awesome things that's going on and church plants that are happening. And my dad was just in Guatemala. And just seeing, like, this local pastor that has started a work and he his goal is five more churches in, in around that area. And people are just flocking to the churches and are just so thankful for the word of God. And I'm just excited because God is moving around the world. And how he's moving is through local churches, is through believers coming in, churches being planted and reaching out. And how many of you know, it matters that I grow because there's a world that needs to be reached. Amen. All right, let's stand up and we will close in prayer. <clears throat> and so I just saw us um, just making a fresh commitment. And uh, I want to just emphasize, this wasn't preaching down. This is hopefully calling all of us up. And this is saying we have to be about his business as this body of believers in this time because he is coming quickly, more quickly. And I don't think it's long where we're going to be here more than just a Sunday and a Wednesday. Because people are going to be flocking to churches. They're going to be flocking to people who are carrying light, who are carrying joy, who are carrying hope, who are not full of fear. And they're going to be flocking into churches. Not just this church, churches all over. And we have to be ready for it. And it's a part of growing up. It matters. Because it's not just me that it affects, it affects other people. And so let's just close our eyes this morning. And no one looking around, but I just wanted us to just make just that prayer of commitment. And that fresh commitment to the Lord to say, Lord, I'm choosing you. And I'm choosing to prioritize you and, and what you're doing. You're building your church. And so I'm going to help partner with you in building your church. And, you know, for some of us, we may have felt disconnected. For some of us, we may have just felt, you know, just where's my place. We may have felt whatever, all these different things. But this morning, I just know that there is just an anointing here to just, it's like just that connecting, that grafting together into the local house that God's called you. And you know, when you're connected, there's a flow. And so some of you have been missing, it's just like a flow. It's felt dry. You've been missing the flow. And, and that's the answer is just reconnecting back, not letting the enemy pull you out with strife and division or with whatever it might be. But just that connecting back and that flow back. And it's that flow. And you know what's amazing when you're connected? It's not just the flow to you. It's also the flow from you that others need. So there's a supply there. So if that's you this morning and you just say, I want to just lift my hand and no one's looking around. I just want to make a fresh commitment to the Lord to say, Lord, I'm committing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I am committing this morning to say, I am about preaching Jesus, everyone in the house, everywhere in the world. And I am making that commitment to say, I am going to connect to the body. I am going to serve. I'm going to give. I'm going to be all in like I've never been before so that Jesus can receive glory. And if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand as just an act of faith and commitment this morning to just say, I'm all in. I'm all in to what he's doing. He is building his church. So, Lord, I thank you. You see the hands across this sanctuary, a fresh commitment to you. And so I thank you even now, a flow, a flow of the spirit, a flow of anointing into each and every one whose hands are lifted this morning, where it's been dry, where it's been frustrating, where you've been having a lot of questions. I thank you just, just in that act of faith of raising your hand, a noticeable difference a noticeable difference in the flow and the connection. Oh, we thank you, Lord, connected and about your plan. And we thank you, a flow of finances, 
a flow of provision. Where there's been lack, you're going to see provision. Where there's been sickness, you're going to see health. Where there's been destruction, you're going to see just, yeah, just restoration there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, into your place. Thank you, Lord. Just let's all lift our hands and say, I take my place. I take my place in the body of Christ. I take my place in this local assembly. And I receive the call. I receive the summoning to be a part of where you've called me. And I don't neglect it. I prioritize it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, that's a promise to you. Those planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. That's a promise. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in families. I've seen it back where I grew up, the people who are planted. And I said, we just went back um, to visit my parents and went to church back in the summertime. And Pastor Nate and I, the thing that we walked away with after we left that service is I said, the things, the two things that blessed me the most is that Pastor Mac and Lynn are still there. He just turned 80. He's still there and he's, he's still going. And he's still about like the next phase of their ministry. And then secondly was seeing people there that were there when I was this big. Guess what? Still, we talked to some of them in the lobby still saying, I'm still believing for this. I'm still believing. God's doing a work in our church and I'm still here and I'm praying and I'm standing. And you know what? They're flourishing because they've stayed planted. Amen. So we can stay planted in God's house with God's people. And remember, you're a part. Look to the person to the left. Look to the person to the right. And guess what? You're all connected in the body. Amen. You have a part. So who can I bless today, even leaving church? Don't just run out the door. Connect. Who can I bless today? What does God want to say to someone else? Amen. Be a part of building up the body. All right. Well, we love you all. We will see you Wednesday night. Enjoy your warm day today. <laughs>